Grant, O oh God, that your holy and life-giving spirit may so move every human heart, and especially the hearts of the people of this land, that barriers which divide us may crumble, suspicions disappear, and hatreds cease, that our divisions being healed, we may live in justice and peace through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Just a quick reminder of our housekeeping and group norms. Welcome to our visitors. I hope that you have by now found our worship services and joined us for worship. Um, you should know where your mute button is and where the chat button is. You'll need to look at the chat for the questions when, when they are uh, put in the chat for you. We are recording uh, this plenary session, but we don't record the breakout rooms where you share personal things. And remember that I and our other clergy are available for private conversations as you need it. Um, we've been paying attention to your comments um, as we've gone along, indicating how you're interpreting and engaging with the, the materials. Um, and that's it's been great to see the engagement. Um, we're going to return to some of those um, comments and responses next week as part of our wrap up of the series. Um, Today, I know that uh, Robbie is going to um, share with us something about John Lewis, um, and I, I want to acknowledge the loss yesterday of two giants um, of civil rights, not just John Lewis, but C.T. Vivian as well, um, men of incredible faith and courage. Um, I, and I'm pretty confident that uh, in due course that we will recognize both of them in our calendar of saints and worthies, and may they both rest in peace. Now I'm going to hand over to Robbie. And thank you, Penny. Uh, good morning, everyone. Hope everyone's doing well. Uh, as, as you mentioned, Penny, we've just lost two giants and not just for civil rights, but for our continued efforts in social justice as we keep moving forward. Uh, and actually this morning, uh, CBS Sunday Morning provided a very short overview that I thought would be most appropriate for us, particularly at this point, as we're reading the book, Waking Up White. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen at this moment. And uh, certainly we will hear much more regarding uh, Dr. Excuse me, uh, C.T. Vivian, Vivian and also, of course, John Lewis. Uh, but truly, uh, uh, the world has lost something. We have two American heroes that we just lost um, just a couple days ago, a day ago. Uh, at this point, um, just want to do a very, very brief recap and segue into a next video. Uh, frankly, as we have moved now through Debbie Irving's uh, book, Waking Up White, uh, we've spent a little bit of time last time in our comfort zone or basically addressing both her comfort zone and ours. Um, we've heard commentary that actually makes very good sense where parties are looking at uh, things that, if you will, extensions of racism, including white privilege, and parties having some discomfort even with the terminology, thinking that it doesn't necessarily apply to them, um, that they didn't ask for it. Uh, but we are also having a type of conversation where we're looking at certain realities as it impacts others in this world, and also, frankly, how even the hidden benefits uh, are affecting all of us in some way. So with that in mind, and we, for those who've done the reading so far, we, you, know, you probably have transversed um, inner work and now maybe outer work. Um, before we can actually really engage, I would think into real true outer work, uh, we also have to make sure we have a good handle on the scope of how racism has both shaped and continues to impact America. And to that end, um, there's also another um, a video that I think we should talk about the, the group that's not mentioned as of yet, um, and that's our Native Americans. So we have actually a, a very short, brief video. And there's other groups as well I should mention, but uh, most of that stay tuned for Sacred Ground <laughs> because uh, we will cover a lot more there. Uh, but right now, I thought it would be somewhat sobering to hear comments from a number of uh, African, excuse me, of uh, uh, Native Americans or Indigenous Americans who um, have a particular point of view that maybe doesn't get enough exposure. So bear with me, I'll share my screen one more time. Uh, 
Okay, I'm back and I think I stopped sharing, hopefully. Yes? Yes. Okay. Um, well, one of the things, reason why we also wanted to transition a little bit to show that even though so much of the civil rights is being captured right now, the civil rights struggle uh, seems to show um, African Americans, it is also an ongoing struggle for many other Americans of color. And and perhaps the most hidden one, or the one that gets the least amount of coverage, are those who are of uh, indigenous people, Native Americans. Um, to the extent that there's also a, an alarming rate of violence being, uh, in terms of people dying at the hands of authorities uh, on Indian land, on Native American land, um, and yet uh, doesn't get much coverage. Um, so if you will, the bottom line with, with this and other parts as we look at the, the insidious uh, implications of racism uh, as it has been with our society from the beginning, uh, it is something that uh, is unrelenting and it, and it requires, uh, in my personal opinion, um, uh, as and John Lewis has done, quite frankly, uh, unwavering effort to try to work against it which is also very consistent to uh, what uh, Debbie Urban put in his book, her book as she went toward the end, uh, that in many ways she has transitioned in different levels of her awakening to the point that she now is looking at what it requires to be an anti-racist. But in a very cautionary way, she's acknowledging all of the fumbles, um, missteps, misinterpretations, even to the extent that even some of her own biases continue to enter into the mix. Can I jump in there with a, a speaking of fumbles? Of um, it's you. something that um, the that clip um, brought up for me um, was a story. I, I'd almost forgotten this, but um, when I went to seminary 26 years ago, my younger son was four years old and uh, he went to nursery school. It was a nursery school with um, people uh, from all around the Yale um, community. And um, one evening, Oh, about six weeks into the semester, I guess, I got a call um, from the mother of another child in Thomas's class. She was very angry. Um, and she said, your son is a racist. And I was completely taken aback. I had no idea what she meant. Um, and she said, your son told my daughter that she's black. He's a racist. Uh, and again, I was flabbergasted and speechless. And she said, um, she, she said, we're, I'm a quarter, she's a quarter Cherokee and a quarter, I think she said a quarter white. And I forget, there was, there was some African in there as well, but it was divided into quarters. And, um, and I, I didn't know what to say. I was um, completely baffled. I said, he, he just called it as he saw it. He was a child fresh from New Hampshire, um, saw a child who had cornrows and had black, dark skin and thought, said, you're black. It wasn't a, a judgment call, but, um, but that, that's continued to, to hover in my consciousness. And um, watching this clip this, that we just saw um, has helped me understand a little bit more um, my own um, ignorance there, because um, I'm, I'm just now really starting to understand how complex the question of uh, racial identity is. You, that woman who was weeping as she said that her African-American grandfather wouldn't leave the room because he thought she would be ashamed of him. Um, the layers of, um, of racism and racial identity are um, incredibly complicated. And when we think about native people, indigenous people, um, another huge eye opener for me was a couple of years ago um, when I learned that um, all the way up to Kansas, large, huge stretches of what is now the United States were Mexico, and there are people who have never moved. Their, camp, their families have never moved from one patch of land, um, and yet they have become American uh, because the, the borders moved. Um, the, the complexity of this is um, absolutely baffling. And one lesson for me is not to assume how somebody identifies themselves, but to ask, because it's, it's often not at all obvious. Um, I think about that, uh, the people at Mount Rushmore, there was a pro, someone at Mount Rushmore who told a Native American posing, uh, protesting on their, on their own sacred ground to go home. I hope none of us will ever be that, um, that blind or ignorant. Anyway, back to Robbie.
Robbie, you're mute. Thank you. I think by week seven, I might get this down. Uh, but uh, let's move now in the interest of time to our, our questions for you. And if you'll bear with me for just one second. Uh, for session six, we have basically two questions. First one is, have you or your family personally experienced a situation in which your racial makeup prevented your family from exercising your full rights and privileges as a U.S. citizen? I'll repeat that one again. Have you or your family personally experienced a situation in which your racial makeup prevented your family from exercising full rights and privileges as U.S. citizens. The second one, some would contend that white privilege provides an advantage that was not necessarily sought by, but benefits most contemporary white Americans. Do you think this benefit influenced your perceptions of people of color? How did race and ethnicity factor into the shaping of your own identity and self-concept? Once again, some would contend that white privilege provides an advantage that was not necessarily sought by, but benefits most contemporary white Americans. Do you think this benefit influenced your perceptions of people of color? How did, you, how did race and ethnicity factor into the shaping of your own identity and self-concept? Uh, please take those questions with you into the breakout session. Uh, and we have roughly about 20 minutes or so. You'll probably see a clock in the upper right-hand corner uh, giving you a countdown. Don't forget to appoint a timekeeper and, uh, and, be, and politely but firmly ask people to stop after three minutes so everyone gets to talk. Thank you. We'll see you on the other side. Okay, so make sure everybody go get the questions. They are in chat, so make sure you open up your chat and then they will follow you to the breakout room. Okay. All right, here we go. Oh. No, we're at about 40 so far. So oh, okay. we're about halfway back. Okay. They trickle, it'll trickle back in. It well, we may want to go, in the interest of time, go quickly for people to have a chance to uh, share openly to the yeah. larger group. Everyone's seeing, back. Seeing 88? 88. Everyone's back. Everyone's oh, great. Back. Welcome back, everybody. Hope you weren't in cyberspace too long <laughs> in the transition. Um, well, we. We've, I had the pleasure to be in a, a wonderful discussion. I, I hope all of you had. And right now we have roughly about 10 minutes thereabouts that we can actually spend some time hearing different shout outs or different commentaries from your respective groups. Uh, feel free if you are going to speak to unmute your mic and uh, share with us, but try to limit your comments to roughly about a minute. Okay, so I guess I'll, I'll say something and it wasn't really, uh... Uh, part of our discussion, but I've been thinking about this a lot. And um, there's an opportunity in the city of Chula Vista for volunteers to become part of a uh, commission that will uh, basically uh, regulate the uh, voting boundaries of um, uh, for a city council. And I'm going to volunteer for that. And I may be asking some of you for a letter of recommendation because that's some of that. But here is why I think it's very important. I think gerrymandering is something that uh, uh, people in power use to uh, uh, maintain their power, and I think it's terribly unfair. Uh, I um, uh, fully applaud the state of California having an independent commission, and this is my opportunity to actually do something about the inequality as opposed to just be a bystander. So I'm going to do it. I'd like to share that the scene behind me in the virtual the virtual photograph is a photograph of Santa Barbara Mission, which was built with the blood and sweat of Native Americans in Southern California. As were all the missions.
We I have right here. Same thing. I made, I made a comment in my group that um, I really had some, like most of us, I guess, um, hesitance if I was walking down the street in the evening and there would be a black person, perhaps homeless or whatever. I would be a lot more cautious. And, and so I had, I, and I just had these things in my brain. Um, I didn't really feel that they were bad or wrong, but last night, and I used to look at, at uh, anyone that was shaped differently, you know, black folks with their characteristics. And last night, as I was watching things with John Lewis, I stopped, I, at first I said, wow, he has big lips. And then I saw Obama come on and I thought, wow, they both do. And here I am trying to get my lips to be bigger. <laughs> but I looked at those lips and I thought, those are luscious. Those are luscious. They, and, I, and, I, and I think, I bet they kiss so beautifully. <laughs> and so I recognize I'm going to start looking for all of the characteristics, both well, and if I don't have an opportunity to talk to them, but just the physical characteristics and turn my thinking around and look at them and enjoy these wonderful characteristics. So I really, uh, that was a turnaround last night for me and I'm hanging on to it. So I um, just wanted to share a, a comment about uh, <laughs> what it, <laughs> It feels a little interesting to be a person, a black person uh, hearing the conversation. And um, in, in the group I was just in, I so appreciate just the, um, the candor and the, the, the willingness to um, sort of say, you know what? our family never experienced anything like that because we were a white family, but, but now I see, or I, I got older and experienced these things and now I see, and then moving from that to, and going forward, I'm going to be an ally. I'm going to be different. And um, I just, um, I cannot articulate in words, how that feels as as somebody who's who's lived a life where everything about um, kind of all the politics of race and gender and the systemic things kind of sit with African American women um, is it gives me hope and I'm so encouraged just about the power of the body of Christ to act against and change mm -hmm. um, so. I appreciate people being willing to be uncomfortable. I appreciate people sharing. Um, and, and I appreciate how it has um, helped me to just understand how people got to where they got. Um, that's just a powerful thing and, and powerful for people to share. Hmm. May I? Um. I just want to say a small reflections that when we read um, the book, there was one chapter so the author was mess up two girls' name. Yes, uh, because the African American background, and that reminds me something happened yesterday when when John Lewis passing away, passing away, and two Republican uh, senator mistaken with him with the Eli's cunning. And mm -hmm. I think this kind of mess up uh, is still happening in contemporary world. And mm -hmm. uh, I think we all need to learn. And even because of that reason, I also look up carefully compare the two persons. And I think I can see this kind of a uh, mess up or confusion of, or I should say, undistinguished two people probably often time happen to um, people of colors, uh, not just African-American. I oftentimes call say, you look like so-and-so. So this is very common. Um, but I can see that if we know the person more, maybe the feature were more recognizable. 
But if we don't know the person well, uh, it's maybe hard to remember their uh, resemblance or differences. And even myself, I think I will probably try to learn, but usually I identify people faster than others. I don't know, is that because I'm a color of people, I don't want to be uh, misidentified or because I'm a visual person. And But I'm just saying that there is a mess up or cannot tell one from the other seems to still very uh, present uh, in the contemporary world in the United States. Can I, can, can I, uh, yes. I have, I have a short uh, anecdote to back up uh, uh, Pat's uh, talking about similarity of faces and becoming uh, uh, more deeply imbued with uh, facial features over time. I, I'm thinking back to how I taught at Norfolk State University, historically black college or university for about eight years. And I remember one time in the, um, one of the faculty in the math department called me George and we were in a meeting and I pointed across the room to my friend George and I said, I'm Doug, he's George. And uh, this faculty member said, oh, you white guys, you all look the same. <laughs> and I, I thought it was just, it was just marvelous. And part of what I spoke to during our uh, meeting in small groups was that over time, I learned to discriminate, as we might call it, uh, facial features, because I had so many black students' faces in front of me, that over time I came to realize that it's really about what you're you looking at, your ability to uh, say these people all look the same, and then if you have enough of their features in front of you, then pretty soon it opens up and you see it really, it really changes over time. Yeah, but a prerequisite to that is you need to care, right? Care enough to see them as individuals and care about, in your case, their, their progress and their success as students. I think it's, it's interesting too, there's a, there's a power question here um, that um, I think, Doug, you, la you laugh and that, you know, it sounds like you took it very lightly when you were mistaken for another white man. Um, but you're, you're, you're in the powerful place in, in, in society and, and it impacts people differently, I think, if they're not in that powerful place and are, uh, and, and are seen as being in the same. And I'd like to make a quick comment that's based, when I read that anecdote, I think it was just last night about the, uh, the woman, the author confusing the names of two black girls on her daughter's team. Ken and I have been watching a Canadian sitcom called Kim's Convenience. And it's about a Korean family who runs a small convenience store in Toronto. And there was an episode once where the 20-year-old um, daughter, Korean, <laughs> but Canadian through and through, and she had been very kindly served by a black waitress as at a restaurant and she actually wanted to make special thanks to her and she went back the next day and she handed a uh, large tip to a black waitress there and said you were so nice to me last night and this black woman said I've never met you <laughs> and she realized that she had chosen the other black waitress <laughs> and uh, that that show portrays Toronto as a seamlessly multicultural city. I think this may be part fantasy, but it is quite beautiful. But in that instance, too, the, the young Korean woman was taught of, about her own biases, or her, her, as Wayne said, her lack of caring, caring enough to really see the person. Yeah. I think there have been lots of studies done. I think it's a universal fact that people have a harder time initially distinguishing people in a different ethnic group of every ethnicity struggles sure. yeah. with that. So I think there is a, like the more you care about it, you make an extra effort. And again, the more you're exposed to something, I think that's why the difference exists because it's what you tend to see more, right? If you take people from different cultures, it's harder for them to identify differences in other people. But I don't think it's always just because they're a racist that they can't see the difference. 
Um, but I, I would suggest effort. I'd suggest that it is definitely because the culture is so predominantly white. When you look at who is it that you see on television, who is it you see in advertisements, who is it you see in magazines, who is it that you see featured in all sorts of things, the number of um, possibilities that you see are overwhelmingly white. So even though, for example, in athletics, you, you see a variety of uh, Latino, African-American, and white, those are probably one of the only areas where you see a huge number of non-white people, perhaps music is another. Uh, but I think that because the culture overwhelmingly focuses on white people in advertising and other things, there's kind of like a uh, an extra shove to being more recognizing white people than other people. Just my thought. I think Penny's comment on power is so interesting because if white is the majority and you combine that with the power because of the majority and our tendency is to confuse spaces that are not in the majority, it, it, what I notice is a tendency for us to avoid the question about privilege and then to focus on, oh, I, I, I mix up all those people over there. I got to work on that instead of how have I benefited from privilege? the self-reflective question instead of oh i got to work on that out there the, the 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 hard question is how have i benefited from confusing those people out there right because that's where the power is the power <coughs> is in my ability to be able to confuse those people that's the hard, that's 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 where i benefit from the power is that i get that ability because i'm in the majority and and to me that's where the real the real mm -hmm challenging question is, at least from my point of view. I'd like can to point one, out. One more if comment. Uh, we are, uh, Gary, just a moment. We're, we're past 10 o'clock and oh, okay. this is a I'm great sorry. conversation, but Margie's got it. She's had her hand up for a while. I'm going to give her the last word. Oh, thank you. Well, one of the things I've really enjoyed doing for quite a few years now is every time I find a service person and, you know, cleaning the bathroom or assisting me, I ask them their name because I want to know who they are and I thank them for keeping the bathroom clean or keeping the counters clean or whatever they're doing. And I get a smile every time. It's just, a, it's a brief little connection. We don't know each other in any depth at all, but, but we, we learn and I tell them my name and they, and it's just been a wonderful way to say hi and, and to not be afraid or or make sure that, you know, not act as if they're not there. And I don't like the invisibility of not speaking or not relating even to the service people or whatever. Anyway, that's been a real fun thing for me to do. And, and I get a smile and they get a smile and life's a little better. Thank you. Uh, Robbie, before I give the closing prayer, do you have any wrap up words? Yeah, you're you're muted. I got it. Thank you. Uh, well, just a, a wonderful conversation. As you could tell, we we have many more pent up things to say. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I want to uh, let people know uh, or remind folks that we have uh, upcoming uh, sacred ground, which actually is going to uh, provide even more avenues for greater exploration. Uh, but as we look into next week, next week is our last part of this seven-part forum, the last session, and it will give us a chance to actually have a lot more exchanges like the one we just had just now, to actually delve into some of the things that have been raised by us as a group, and to uh, put, if you will, a, a final touch on the reading that we've been going through on Waking Up White. Uh, thank you so much for your participation. Thank you. Thanks, Robbie. Um, Thank and if you are looking for homework, besides looking at Sacred Ground and hopefully signing up for it, um, as, as you finish up the book, the Waking Up Bike book, be sure to pay attention to the resources in the back of the book. There's a lot of great further reading and um, opportunities. Let us could, I share that, could I share that uh, Catherine Bunch uh, has uh, the Howard Thurman book uh, that we need for Sacred Ground. She has it available. It's about 20 years old, so it's out of print yeah, right no, now. It's, it's more than 20, but yeah. Yeah, something like that, but she has copies. Yeah, okay, thank you, Gary. Let us pray. 
O God, you have bound us together in a common life. Help us in the midst of our struggles for justice and truth to confront one another without hatred or bitterness and to work together with mutual forbearance and respect through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Have a great week. Thank you so very much.